meaning progression. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Well, yes and no. I, I think I might have an example of that I can show you. So Lacey just asked about median regression. In regression that we've been talking about so far, in regression that we've been talking about so far, we've been modeling the conditional mean of y. I've been, after all, I've just been talking about weighted averages, right? So this line, my sample regression function, is the conditional mean of y, or the mean of y conditional on x. So for a given x, this is the mean, the point on this line is the mean of y. So the argument is that for a given x, there's a probability distribution over the possible y's that we could realize. And so my sample mean happens to be right there. So the, the little bump looks like a normal distribution, and that sticks out of the board for you. So that's the density conditional on y, conditional on x. And so Lacey just asked about median regression. Rather than model the conditional mean, why don't we model the conditional median? And Lacey, why might we do that? My sense was if you have if the data is distributed in an odd manner, you can't transform it into a linear equation. You can use the median, and it gives you signs, right, from what your regression is. I think I agree with what you're saying. And the outliers, right? It's four means of extreme data. Yeah. So, for example, if I computed the mean age of students in the classroom, I would get some number, but if I computed the mean age of everybody in the classroom, because I'm in here, the mean would be pulled to the high end, even though there are a lot of young people in here. You got one somewhat <laughs> heterogeneous group. Right, there's a heterogeneous age group in here. And so I pull the mean way up because the mean is the least squared estimator of the true average because there's an outlier in here in the mean. Uh, the mean gets pulled up. But if I, if somebody asked me what the median age was, I'd just line up the whole class from youngest to oldest and I'd count to the middle person. And that's the median age. And that's a much better reflection of central tendency in this group than reporting the mean. So that the median is much less sensitive to outliers. Also, when we do, notice the way I chose to draw my figure on the board. I told you that that bell-shaped curve looks like a normal distribution just sticking out of the board toward you. It's nice and symmetric and nice and smooth, and it's got long, thin tails, which means that we're as likely to see a data point above the mean as we are to see one below the mean. And because the tails are long and thin, we're not very likely to see extreme observation. However, there are other circumstances where the tails are long and thick, and the conditional distribution of y is perhaps asymmetric. If all we're doing is fitting conditional means, we would never know that. We'd never see it, because all we're doing is looking at the mean, the conditional mean of y. And it tells us nothing about the, the shape of the conditional distribution of y. So Lacey was interested in knowing something more about the, dis the conditional distribution of y. So there's another example of things I've been working on related to all this stuff with uh, monkeys. In this figure, on the vertical axis, we have the price of monkeys. And on the horizontal axis, I'm not sure. I want to write on it. Is quantity, and the vertical axis is price. So each data point, for example, this data point is the average price of uh, is the price of a monkey on the day when only one showed up. Another day, one monkey showed up, and he cost ten thousand whatever the unit currency. Another day, another monkey showed, just one showed up, it cost 15000 Over here, however, this data point, for example, is generated from the day when three monkeys showed up, and the average price of the monkeys that showed up in the market that day was 10,000 units of currency. So that the average price of monkeys showed up on a given day. So I plotted those data points, no lines in the figure, and I got that kind of thing that looks like a pennant or a triangle waving off the dirt black. What's the definition of consumer surplus? Uh, What's consumer surplus? It's what uh, consumer pays versus what they do with that. I haven't gave those all consumers. And producer surplus is the difference between what the seller gets and what they were willing to let it go for. So in the usual price quantity figure, we have equilibrium price and quantity and Consumer surplus is the red triangle, and producer surplus is the blue triangle, and economic surplus is the sum of the two. When you're collecting price-quantity pairs, you go out and you collect some data at the 
and all you want to collect data on the price of coffee and the number of cups sold per day at all the different little food trucks around campus. And you plot all those price quantity pairs. The scatter gram that you get, plotting all those price quantity pairs across all the trucks on campus through all the days of the week, all those price quantity pairs have to lie inside that triangle, right? You could never see a price above the demand curve for any given quantity. Have you ever observed a price above the demand curve? It can't happen. If you remember the demand curve is a set of reservation prices of people who drink coffee. The points, can you ever observe a point below the supply curve? No, because the supply curve is a set of reservation prices for those who are selling coffee. So all the price quantity pairs that you observe have to lie inside the triangle. You can't ever see anybody up here or out here or down there. So I plotted my price quantity pairs and it took me a long time before it dawned on me that what I had observed was all the price quantity pairs that corresponded to different points in economic surplus. The area has been closed by the supply curve and the demand curve. So why didn't they fall on the demand curve or on the supply curve? Were the demand curves and supply curves jumping around so much that they produced all those different pairs? Well, no. There probably is a demand curve for monkeys, and there probably is a supply curve for monkeys. But the market for bushmeat in Marlboro doesn't work like uh, the way economic textbooks write about markets. Instead, there are some a few sellers in the market every day. There's a group of women called Mamas who run the bushmeat stalls. And it's not a big city. It's, I think it's under 100,000 people. And there's only one market. So on any given day, there are not a lot of people that come to buy a monkey or uh, an armadillo. It looks kind of like an armadillo. It's not really like and so what you do is you go to the mama and you bargain with her about the price that you're going to pay for the monkey. So what's happened is that in this data set, there is a strategic demand curve which governs how much you're willing to pay. And there is a strategic supply curve which governs how much, how little the mama is willing to take. So, Chu is working as a mama today. And I want to have, I'm, I'm having a big party tonight and I'm going to serve them a, a mandrill. Or the great big monkeys are pretty long in size. And, what? yes, they are. That's the whole problem. That's why we're looking at the problem. So I, I see that Chu Deng has one. And I have to, I know in my mind what my reservation price is, and she knows what her reservation price is. As it happens, she knows that that particular drill was actually shot two days ago, and out in the rainforest they don't have any refrigeration. Two day old carcass has been hanging around for a while without refrigeration. I'm not exactly sure how old it is, but I also know that Chu doesn't have any refrigeration in this market, and she doesn't have refrigeration back at her house in store for all these monkeys. I know. She's got to sell it today. She's looking at me. She says, "Well, he's pretty shabbily dressed. He's not too. He's not too affluent. So his reservation price must be pretty low." So the two of us bargain, and all we're bargaining about is how to divide up the economic surplus between buyer and seller. So any point in the scatter is how we divide it up the economic surplus, which falls between the demand curve and the supply curve. So to come back to Lacey's question, why not do median regression? Well. <coughs> The dashed line is the least squares line fitted to the price quantity pairs. It has a positive slope. What's the meaning of that? It has no meaning. It's just somebody mindlessly, in this case, fitting a straight line to the data. It has no natural interpretation. In the context of anything, it has no interpretation. The median regression line is the horizontal solid line. Conditional on one carcass coming to market in the day, the median price is a little over 10,000 currency. Conditional on four, four monkeys coming to market, the median price is a little over 10,000 currency. So the median price is quite stable, regardless of the number of monkeys that come to market. The realized price varies on either side of it, because sometimes the mamas are really desperate to get rid of these things, because they've been hanging around for a few days, and if they just throw it in the trash, they lose everything. And other days, the people who come to buy them are really eager to get a monkey so they can impress their friends. These are luxury goods. They're very expensive. Um, so they want to impress their friends, and so they reveal too quickly what their high reservation price is.